will schedule that on some facility <laughs> yeah, sure, okay sure. after yes. after 45 minutes so i I'll, i'll be here but i may not uh, keep for longer so so sorry about that but, but i would love to love to yeah. okay okay you can time. you can see my slide right yeah. yes yes we can see any changes exactly. right yes exactly it's completely fine Just one second. Let me quickly look into one of videos are working. Yeah, obviously, okay. completely. No. Okay. Okay. So, Shomit. Yes, sir. You must start. So, welcome all. Welcome and good morning to all. Welcome to our webinar series. We have organized a few webinar series before this, and this time we have organized jointly organized from the IEEE MTTS SBC IITB issue and IEEE Photonic Society IITB issue chapter. and this time the topic is on nano structured meta surfaces and fiber based uh, devices via controlled via fluid instabilities and this talk will be delivered by professor tapojiti dasgupta from iisc bangalore so before uh, starting i would like to request uh, dr santru das to say few words on this uh, webinar over to you sir Okay, so very good morning to you all, and and on behalf of uh, IEEE Photonic Society Student Branch Chapter IEEG, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Tapur Jyoti Dasgupta uh, on this webinar platform. And, and first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to join us for an uh, for an uh, webinar series. So uh, here in this IEEE Photonic Society, we, we We try to focus on various kind of webinar, different uh, learning experience we gone through before COVID. We try to organize several uh, physical meetings from people outside, and this way our activities are slowly uh, increasing. And, and we are trying our best uh, apart from our regular responsibilities. And and of course, I would like to thank Dr. Somog Professor here from as a chair, uh, actually MTT Society Student Branch of the IIT, who agreed and who who specifically took this initiative to organize this uh, webinar. So, so with this, I I really do not want to keep keep a long uh, version because today <laughs> we want to listen to the presentation. So. So with this, uh, uh, Sombit, please keep continue and, and let's welcome uh, Dr. Dasgupta for giving his talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Now I would like to Dr. Somak Bhattacharya, sir, the faculty advisor of IITBL MTS SBC IITBHU, to introduce Professor Tapojiti Dasgupta, sir. Over to you, sir. Okay. So thank you and good morning to all of you for this particular webinar organized jointly by. IEEE MTT Student Branch Chapter IIT BHU as well as IEEE Photonic Society Student Branch Chapter IIT BHU. So it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Dasgupta, who incidentally was my junior in my alma mater. So let me just be very brief and let me read out his biography. So Tapojyoti Dasgupta obtained his B.Sc. and B.Tech in Physics and Radio Physics and Electronics, respectively, from. University of Calcutta in 2006 and 2009 he then moved to France where he obtained his MSc in nano science from Ecole Polytechnic in 2012 and PhD in condensed matter physics lab from the same institute in 2015 under professor Thierry Gacoin and Alistair Rowe he then joined professor Fabian Sorin's lab of fiber optics and photonic devices in Ecole Polytechnic Federal de Lucerne EPFL during 2015 December to 2019 November he also served in the electrical engineering department in India Institute of Technology Kanpur for 5 months from January 2020 to May 2020 before joining the department of instrumentation and applied physics in July 2020 so without wasting any kind further time so let me hand over it to dr dasgupta Thank you for the nice introduction and a very uh, good uh, morning to you all, and thanks for inviting me to this uh, IEEE Students Branch uh, webinar series and IEEE Photonic Society Students Branch web webinar series of IIT BHU. 
So as uh, Dr. Shomok has said about me, uh, so I uh, uh, so I recently joined IISC in the Department of Instrumentation and Applied Physics here, as you can see, the new logo, where we actually uh, do applied physics, mostly related, uh, starting uh, from uh, biomedical devices uh, to core physics also, like on 2D materials, photonics, applications, sensors, and various faculties works on various streams. And today, what I will be talking to you about is uh, mainly what uh, I propose. I recently joined, so what I propose to do in India, and uh, so and a brief uh, introduction of uh, what I have done so far during my postdocs, uh, etc., and during my stay in EPFL. So the basics. So this is uh, the our logo here, Lance, which is, which is the lab here. Um, and the uh, uh, full form goes to Laboratory of Advanced Nanostructures for Photonics and Electronics. So uh, the main idea of our uh, research work is to work on this main topic, soft electronics and photonics. We are mainly processing, you can think of it as a processing lab, but we do fundamental science. And why do we need soft photonics and electronics for a sustainable futures? Uh, think about, for example, in health and uh, personalized care, like beds or prevention, where you do, you cannot think about using a rigid sensor, right? Because it will lead to the problem of the source more, right? So you need soft sensors in these cases. Secondly, when you think about in robotics arms or in prosthetics, where we need electronics gadgets uh, in cubi in incorporated inside the soft electronics part also. Uh, we also have an uh, intention to work on uh, biomedical devices like smart sutures for wound dressing, biodegradable using biodegradable various biodegradable materials. So I won't be talking much on this. And uh, soft photonics and electronics also works uh, is uh, used nowadays and kind of a hot topic these days for sensing photonics energies, which you, where you can think that you can make some wearable devices using this. Think about integrating inside your clothing. There are two things that you should take into one account in these days. Number one, the device, uh, what are the properties? Of course, it needs to sense your, uh, let's say, blood, the pressure, etc. And second thing is the aesthetic value, which is also very important, which I will show you in the coming slides. Our 2D counterpart is unable to do because you cannot think about putting a rigid material on your or whatever you call it, a tattoo or whatever, uh, rigid material on top of your clothing, then you need to think about encapsulation. We'll show how finding a different way we can always integrate these type of sensors inside uh, our clothing. And that also keeps the aesthetic value. This is what we, if we want to sell this, for example, as wearable electronics or, wear or wearable photonics, these things in the market values, we should keep this in mind always. Second is also for fiber probes, imaging, and implants. And also, we'll see that how we can use in 2D materials or 2D planar structures or photo for what is also known as meta surfaces. So, with this, our research interest goes uh, what we address or what are the challenges that is uh, there still in industry from industrial perspective. about unconventional substrate do remember that it means bendable stretchable stretchable up to 600 percent 1d uh, and to incorporate these complex functionalities that said that has been so far been on silicon photonics or on electronics based on silicons which involves a lot of um, equipments and thus a higher footprint how to reduce that we have to think that also to make it a cost effective process. This has a huge uh, good uh, properties, innovative properties. Moving this nano to something where we can make kilometers long, five kilometers long structures. Okay, tens of meters or at least centimeters long. Now, to do this, our vision is mainly to use advanced fluid-based ma manufacturing process that is reconciling the fluid process with multimaterial nano architecture and advanced functionalities. And when I talk about this, 
you are on two end you have a rigid telephone here mobile phone the smartphone that you use it for your day to day life the, uh, the con is here is it's rigid but the pro is that it has a lot of functionalities incorporated inside the single uh, device right so you have the sensors you have lenses you have electronics all incorporated on the other hand you have these fibers which are very flexible right you can think of copper wire so these are actually copper wires which are like fibers which are very flexible well not stretchable but still can be made stretchable in a few different materials but limited functionalities right so why don't we incorporate and think about a process technology where we use the flexibility of these fibers put it into these uh, planar structures that uh, with lot of functionalities right so that means it becomes a flexible planar structure so we'll show few application in optics and later on hopefully by next two years we'll be able to show something from my lab in land some in electronics also and uh, that means you make your photonics flexible and stretchable uh, so called this meta surfaces meta lenses i'll show you few examples or your electronics flexible stretchable by the way so samsung has shown some flexible phone now which is bendable okay but then the problem there if i am not wrong correct me is that the electronics there still is actually made of rigid materials okay now when i uh, so our idea is to use this flexibility to this rigid materials and convert them into flexible and similarly the complex functionalities that are present here should be moved to something on these fibers which are very very simple has a simple functionality and how do we address that of course we do study fundamental material science prop and physics problem of fluid dynamics instabilities rheological problems of the materials what specific microstructures we can make for specific applications what new materials we can propose what is the process technology and what new architecture and when we address this fundamental questions which is good for fundamental science but for what applications and thus this helps us to propose novel device concepts and application which can really have a impact in a technological impact in terms of world scenario so the research at lands is focuses on uh, these techniques that engineering the fluid flow instabilities for the scalable nanofabrication of soft electronic and photonic devices over large area substrates when we talk about planar structures is less than tens of centimeters um, or on fibers and to integrate them inside fabrics to do this two things we i will be talking today about is one is template assisted dewetting to make large area planar structures or the so called meta surfaces the second is a thermal drawing process actually i'll talk thermal drawing process before the template dewetting and recently thanks to the ministry of electronics we are working on a process another process which i will not talk now but of additive manufacturing of photonic devices that means via 3d printing okay if you are interested we can talk on this more later on but this is a recent project that we have uh, got from the ministry of electronics so this allows us to as i was telling you before that once we have the fundamental understanding of the interplay between the viscosity tension the surface tension properties of the materials the rheology micro and nano structures we have this idea to fabricate simple uh, we find a very simple scalable cost effective process uh, to uh, fabricate uh, nano structures or micro structure d1d or 2d multimaterial system devices for various applications okay so uh, let's start first with this thermal drawing process and uh, please stop me whenever you feel like okay uh, the thermal drawing process as i was telling you that one of the technique and what is this uh, thermal drawing process uh, so you must have been all familiar with optical fibers where what happens here there you see a cartoon on the left you take a preform that means a large uh, bigger structure you put it inside a oven which is raised at particular temperature and which is near to the glass transition temperature of your preform okay and uh, then what happens you start to pull these fibers pull this starts to melt or not exactly melting 
but it starts to rather have a viscous flow. Okay, and as it flows, you pull it with a pulley here, down here, you see, and then you get uh, the fiber. This is a very traditional way to make uh, optical fiber, very well known in industry also, they apply. And if you are interested, uh, you can have in, in Kolkata, in CGCRI, they have a good drawing, thermal drawing tower. However, what we use, we don't use glass, rather we use flexible and stretchable polymers. And when we think of fibers, you can think about your clothes are made of fibers. That means very easily integrable within your uh, wearable and thus making it wearables. Another thing that you should uh, understand that this process is scalable and low cost. Okay, so it's a processing technology which we are borrowing from optical fiber industry. But then uh, in optical fibers, it's not multi-materials, number one. So why don't we use it, this technique to draw multi-material fibers and having different unique structures. So photonic crystal fibers has already been made in optical industry, sorry. And uh, how do we address that? We address it by understanding again, the fluid dynamics, the instabilities, the material properties and the rheological properties of the uh, material when proposed with, uh, for new materials with new application. One thing that I was telling you, when I talk about scalable and low cost, right? So why do I say always the scalable and low cost? Of course, it's economically very much important to have it low cost. But look here, in your preform level, you can make various micro uh, millimeter size scale structures. You can think, I'll show you a few examples where you can drill holes, things about things, just think about drilling some holes in your large centimeter scale preform. And now when you draw them, because the volume remains constant, right? Your length is increasing. So these diameters of the holes will start to reduce and go down to few orders of micrometers. And sometimes what uh, one example will be something below 40 nanometer around also you can go down. Of course, it depends on the material what you are trying to draw. But that means from you don't necessarily need a lithographic process, which involves a lot of machineries, right, uh, to make these um, devices. So there is no need of lithography, a single step, of course, you need a preform to make. And uh, you have just an oven and you are, have a draw tower where you can draw. So it's a, see, it boils down, the total thing boils down to a single machine. That's why low cost, okay? So uh, as an example, I'll show you two types of five, two or three types of fibers, uh, multi-material hybrid fibers where we were doing some optoelectronic applications. And how does it work is, uh, so you make this preform by rolling uh, some polymer, that is the PC or PMMA and polystyrene. And then you can drill some holes, as I was telling you, drill some holes, make some channels inside. So you have these gray channels here, okay? And some other holes where you can make the electrode. So I'll come, and then you draw, or you can incorporate various, so this is one example, but you can incorporate various materials inside your preform and then you think about drawing so the dimension will scale down when you draw right this is for example in millimeter scale and this goes down inside the fiber it goes down to a few micrometer or sometimes to nanometer order so one example was this optoelectronic fiber and uh, just to show you look at this cartoon carefully so this is the preform this side is a preform and uh, this is the fiber after drawing so if you look into the preform, you drill, as I was telling you, drill hole, you make the electrodes, everything, and you have a fiber where through the core, this is the core of the fiber, you can pass light. And on the surrounding, on the tip of the fiber, you can see this is the cross optical cross section here. You have this one, the bright ones are called selenium nanowires, where the images you can see here, okay? These are selenium nanowires. And selenium is a very good uh, optoelectronic materials, material, and uh, it has a band gap around 700 nanometer, okay? This is an indirect band gap material. It has a band gap around 700 nanometer, and that means it covers more or less uh, the whole visible range and a good material for photodetectors. <coughs> so now to show the effect, so the more details I won't say, you can look into the paper on what is uh, the maximum, what is the efficiency of the device. But uh, what I wanted to say you to show that uh, 
to show that the, UK, the same device acts as a source as well as a detector. That means you can put light through the code, right? You shine light through the code on this rhodamine dye. So this is rhodamine dye, okay? So which is a fluorescence dye, rhodamine, I think it's 6G dye, which is a fluorescent dye. And you shine, uh, let's say, green light. And because these molecules are fluorescent, they fluoresce and they emit in all directions, right? So when they emit in all direction, these chalcogenide nanowats, the selenium nanowats, starts to absorb this light, right? And they convert this, of course, they convert the absorbed light into corresponding photocurrent. And the map of this EPFL logo that you see here is the photocurrent map, okay? So that means you can use, you don't need separately a source and detector if you want to use for biology, for microscopy, for example. And you can just put the detector, so the selenium acts as a detector here, and the, light, the source and detector can be from the same fibers. Now, of course, to increase the efficiency of this detection, you can think about integrating more selenium nanowire strut architecture all over this fiber cross section, right? So when you think about this, when you integrate more, then of course you detect, you get uh, the detector will get the more, more light, the scattered light out from the fluorescent uh, of the fluorescent molecules, and thus helps in higher detection. So here, for an example, as a proof of concept, we showed two, but you can actually go up to as much as as many as you want. Okay, so there is no post-processing involved directly. Selenium has been made to selenium nanowires. Okay. So the second application is, uh, now this was a flexible uh, fiber because it's a polymer, thermoplastic polymer, uh, the polycarbonate and PMMA. Now we will be talking you something called a stretchable fiber. So I don't have example to show you here. So these materials, SCBS is a block copolymer, styridinethylene block copolymer. And this can be stretched up to 600% or uh, the commercial, they say is 800%, but to be in safe side, you can stretch up till 600%. And now so in the same way, you make different architecture as I show you like some grating structures, which you can see, which is the cause of this color here, or you can make some, uh, co the step index fibers, as you see by making two elastomers. or some photonic crystal architecture also. The one of the application is that you can think about, you take this fiber and make some channels inside, right, by drawing, and then you can uh, post-process it by injecting some liquid metals. And by liquid metals, I don't think uh, it is uh, it is not uh, mercury, but gallium and its alloys, which remains liquid at around room temperature, around 30 degrees Celsius. And now you think about stretching it, right? So when you think about stretching it, the electrodes, this, uh, the, so if you have a single channel, let's say, the electrodes will change it in its length, right? Because you are stretching and similarly decrease in its thickness because your volumes remain the same. And uh, so the resistance, the effective resistance changes because the R equal to rho L by A, you can think about length is increasing, area is decreasing, the blue into the width multiplied by the thickness. And this could be easily used as a strain sensor. You see how by applying up to 300, so here we show up to 300% strain, you could see the change in the uh, delta R by R. And similarly, now you can think about putting two electrodes, simple like two parallel plate capacitors, right? And then you again stretch your area, a distance between the two plates decreases. You can think about this geometry, D decreases, and uh, similarly your areas will change, and you could similarly use this as a capacitive sensors also few examples I would like to now show you and uh, one of these is that I hope you can hear the sound is a pressure sensing uh, fiber but actually you have these two electrodes okay so what happens is that you have these two electrodes here okay which is uh, metal you can put liquid metals or composites whatever and now you are pressing here right so you have all the electric circuit here. Okay, so I'm not doing this. You are pressing here. Now the resistance equal to R rho L by A, right? And so that means where you are pressing, it gets short circuited, right? So you have your equivalent circuit actually becomes is dependent upon where you are pressing. So this R1, R2, R3, and R4 starts to change there. 
and that's how it is detecting the position where you are placing the fiber okay so very simple way without involving i don't know why the sounds are coming uh, let me just escape from it yeah so a very simple way to integrate this into clothing so sorry so next is that's what we are showing that you integrate you can easily integrate them inside the clothes and it can act as a like so this is like it is changing its resistance and similarly a stretchable electrodes where you see that it's bending okay you can think of using it in robotics arms where it is also bending right uh are we only limited by electronics no we are also going to the photonics and here i am showing you sorry um let me do it another time i'm showing you a black fiber so you have a stacks of uh, these stretchable materials that means the scalability i'm taking you can go down to hundreds of nanometer the refractive index is around 1.4 so you can just do a quick calculation to have um, this kind of black filters okay so that can be used as a stretchable photonic application the last one you can see again i'm coming back to the pressure sensor where this guy andreas is pressing the fiber which is integrated the black ones are the fibers integrated inside the cloth and you can look into this uh, small adreno where it's actually sensing the applications uh, kind of a bunch of application that i wanted to show you it's not only the just uh, sensors but also used for energy harvesting like a triboelectric fibers okay so more details you can look into the paper from my previous lab it acts as a biodegradable fiber for drug delivery also at the end of the day you can also draw food like a spaghetti if you think which is down to 60 micron in diameter okay so this is a project of a nest of with nestle so you can uh, think about drawing fibers or drawing spaghettis out of this by this technique okay so where varieties of processes and uh, applications can be done by this uh, using this technique which is yet not much uh, uh, still lying in this optical fiber uh, domain but can be pushed towards stretchable and uh, flexible photonics and electronics the process uh, okay with this uh, i go to this uh, the other part where i was talking to you about to finding a scalable technique to prepare planar structures which i think more you will be interested in and what is called recently called meta surfaces just a brief introduction of what is meta surface they are sub wavelength structures which are used to control the phase and amplitude of the light so yesterday if you were there in the talk uh, i have shared uh, there was a good discussion on what meta surface is about and they in recent years the last decade actually and still ongoing they have shown plethora of applications right so one is of course using what is so called this flat lenses these are very important applications where you can drastically reduce the dimension of your dslr cameras that's what they are predicting uh in addition compared to the plasmonic uh, so called this plasmonic structures they are interesting they are nice but as we know plasmonics metals are lossy so you have to pay a cost lossy right so people has moved to so called this dielectric uh, meta surfaces where mostly materials that were used is uh, silicon based materials and as you know silicon is not at all a very good material for visible application and then so what people started to do is to go for tio2 where they have shown mechanically tunable meta surfaces so uh, just a con of this uh, or the disadvantage of this process i'd like to point out is the process undergoes a lift off technique okay so they lift off the tio2 and transfer the uh, structures on pdms and when you think about transferring any uh, nano structures fidelity is a big issue and if it is not uniform then you don't uh, expect to have such kind of uh, uh, applications uh, like for using it as a lens or etc where uh, feature sizes are very very important so that should be kept in mind always so in addition they are used for non linear fanorism meta surface wavefront imaging and very recently for biosensing applications 
which has they have shown really good applications in all these domain and now they are moving for optical computations etc but anyway leave aside the things what is more important is to know from here and to uh, show see from these scm images that these scm images are no doubt very very complex involving high aspect ratio number 1 complexity in the structures which you see here okay and uh, also here and that means for such kinds of niche app, niche application you need to have a precise location of the particles control over the shape and size and a very important thing is that you need to choose your material wisely because uh, you cannot of course choose silicon or germanium for uh, your uh, visible light application alternative is tio2 which is very can be easily readily available and it's biocompatible also because it's used in your cosmetics in sunscreen lotions and uh, but then this tio2 has a low index okay so 2.4 2.3 that means if you want to have achieve similar optical properties you need to make a higher aspect ratio structures okay larger structures which is sometimes also not feasible so that's why this choice of materials are very very important and to do that as i was telling that uh, the problematic still still remains is one is a technical challenge that is mass production scalability of fabrication and of although lithography has done a lot and no doubt we cannot uh, say that lithography is bad because it is it has really shown how much precise it can be but one disadvantage and which is the biggest uh, disadvantage of lithographic process is it number one is not scalable and secondly due to is involved with invo due to because it involves a lot of machineries and clean room processing technique it does means that it uses a lot of equipments and uh, then the cost drastically goes up if you go down to nanometers the number of hours do matter and then the cost similarly is exponentially rises and this is not this is a challenging process and so industries and others are looking for alternative method second is material challenge uh, a quest for what we call what i call it is quest for non silicon based materials silicon is very good because of its cmos process technology because it's a known material but then you cannot apply it for everywhere of course silicon is abundant that's another reason so why don't we go for other materials in the visible if we want to move into visible processing on unconventional substrate now when i talk about processing on unconventional substrate that means what people has done is by lift off technique and i was telling you there is a con there disadvantage is a uh, lift off does not give good fidelity so how can we process on unconventional substrate cost as i told you before transparent materials invisible and keeping in mind of high index so the approach uh, that we process uh, that we follow and i will be talking to briefly on this is a nano imprinting process which leads to mass which can which is a scalable technique involving practically one machine which we can always debate a low temperature processing technology that having said that if it is a low temperature processing that means it is compatible with unconventional substrate because you cannot think of about uh, a high temperature sorry high temperature processing scalability processing technique and you think of using it on a flexible substrate a polymer polymer will just burn off okay so when we so we have to find so we process at lower temperatures typically around 80 degrees celsius so i'll show you a few examples and our material of choice is chalcogenide glasses. So uh, just a brief introduction of what is this chalcogenide glass. They don't have this uh, periodic table. But these are those materials belonging to the group of oxygen. They are called chalcogen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium. All these materials are called uh, chalcogens. And when they alloy with uh, their count, their groups nearby like arsenic, with selenide, it forms arsenic triselenide. Similarly, arsenic sulfide, uh, germanium antimony telluride. All these guys are used, and they are called chalcogenides. They are high index materials. Uh, there has been a lot in use in CD industries for memory applications. Okay, so it was well known. Germanium antimony telluride is a very and germanium telluride is a very well known material because of its. so much used in visible 
but if you can tune their uh, properties you can move it down to with band gap in the near visible or sometimes in the visible region that means you have a pretty open uh, transparency above in the visible also if you uh, because they are very easily you can alloy them okay mix those things the other materials which i will not talk about is liquid metals gallium based structures which i introduced fluid based processes so these are the processing techniques so what i will be talking today about is mainly on chalcogenides and our uh, process techniques is a self assembly of nanostructure glass based metal surfaces glass they are called inorganic uh, glasses because of their amorphous nature they are similar to those of optical glasses you are, they are also known as optical glasses via templated fluid instabilities so how does it work let's go back uh, quickly to the process technique so you do a soft imprinting on a polymer substrate rigid whatever you want or stretchable you do a thin film deposition of your chalcogenide glass and then put it in a hot plate at 80 degrees celsius of course this depends on the material uh, so let's say selenium you put it at 80 degrees celsius and then what happens the film breaks up into these well organized particles here you see very uniform in structures and i'll see you how you control the uniformity also so of course now you understand that the template behind dictates your position right and the shape of the particles the size can also be tuned by tuning the thickness initial what thickness that you use let's say 40 nanometer and 60 nanometer won't give the same thickness as you see as you see here that as you increase the thickness your particle diameter starts to increase second point that i would like to always mention these particles are amorphous in nature this is our tm uh, dark field pattern and you see that they are amorphous in nature and that means they don't have any scattering laws arising because of this polycrystallinity or more uh, the crystallinity facets okay and very good material for photonic application with this we can fabricate some large area so approximately i think if i remember well something around 20 centimeter across uh, 10 to 12 centimeter in width large area logos so and uh, which you can maintain a very well uh, uh, size dispersions, which we'll see later. So these process techniques allow to have a large area, low temperature compatible process. And thus uh, you can think, see that it's a flexible material without undergoing any lift up process. We get, uh, we fab can fabricate flexible photonics and stretchable for, for applications in flexibles and stretchable photonics. So how does this process work? Which is very key uh, to get a, a well-defined structure. And as I was telling you that, uh, so here in the cartoon, as you increase, so as I was telling you, put in a hot plate and then the film manages to form nanoparticles. I'm showing you here as a function of, as, a, as you increase the time of duetting, okay, as you increase the time of heating, how the film, you see, this was the continuous, not exactly continuous, already some holes have appeared, breaks up to form well-ordered particles, okay? So here in the cartoon, I show you that this is a thin film over the template. And as you increase the time, what happens is that reflow occurs. So the fluid from the top starts to flow from to, towards the bottom, right? And then as this becomes very, very thin, it undergoes a pinch off and then surface energy to minimize the surface energy, you get this kind of spherical droplet style. So if you do all this Navier-Stokes uh, equation and try to solve this problem, the evolution of time, film over thickness over time, follows this equation. This is a very simple equation, uh, or maybe very complex, but uh, what matters, what I want to show you here, few parameters that are important. One, gamma term, the surface energy or the surface tension between the fluid and the substrate, the viscosity, and the initial thickness. And then there is what is called phi age, which is we call it a disjoining pressure or disjoining force or pressure, which takes into account of the interaction between the fluid, the chalcogenide fluid and the substrate, okay? The Van der Waals force of interaction. But initially in the first stage, when the film is thick, let's consider this cartoon, the first one. 
the substrate shape we keep it sinusoidal one dimensional just for simplicity you can consider 2d also but that makes things complicated which has a periodicity of k so that means you have a wave number okay which is the periodicity of k and then we can easily neglect the surface the substrate and the fluid interaction because the film is still thick and then if i solve this equation our time scale it just that you get a time scale and time constant which is dependent on you see the periodicity initial thickness viscosity and the surface tension so all these things do matter okay so you have to judiciously choose your substrate and the thickness and the material failing which you won't get a good uh, structure so i'll show you in the next slide how to achieve further better structure in the second stage now as the flu fluid starts to fall down it becomes very thin here right as it becomes very very thin interaction comes between the van der waals interaction between the surface and your uh, film starts to that means your film starts to see the substrate and you have the interaction starting and then of course if you solve again you get what is called spinoidal instability okay and which is again dependent on another wave number not the periodicity this is depend this is a typical material property okay and also the property of the substrate now as you understand that to induce a proper duating that these two time scale a competition between that reflow time scale and spinoidal time scale is very very important right that the reflow should be faster than the spinoidal failing which you will not get a well ordered particle that means this condition should be taken into account and that means when i think about this how do i control this is to have a control over your material properties thickness and the substrate okay for achieving perfect duating now let's consider that so as i was telling you if your spinoidal time scale is faster than the reflow you have your arrays here right this is the arrays okay and then you get all random particles all over not at all a good way to do your meta surfaces now let's consider that your reflow is faster right so but still you can get defects right because this is a process which we don't involve we say that it doesn't involve clean room a bit of pressure change can tune your structures and that means we can divide your defects into what is called interstitial that is particle forming on the top coming from the word interstitial in your the defects in your when you learn your solid states then there can be vacancies okay and there can be size distribution these are the three defects that uh, which is very very crucial and we should try to minimize them as far as possible these do these are there in lithography also but much much less in number now how do we so 3% 15% and 10% is quite a large number right so and we cannot really use these kind of structures in uh, for this applications in meta surfaces meta lenses etc so if you now tune the curvature we get a real perfect array or a, i don't say real perfect array but a near perfect array with interstitial or probability of interstitial vacancy and size distribution goes down nearly zero and here i am showing a large area icm image the periodicity the interparticle distance here is around 350 nanometer so you can see you, it has been done over the statistical distribution and is done over using tens of images similar images okay so you can see that you get by this process very near perfect arrays um which does not have in reality we don't see any defect at least in this large scale in the icm this is the largest image that we can take we cannot take more than that because the icm also has certain limitations so uh, with this i'd like to also say that it's not only square lattices that are important you can go down to triangular or hexagonal lattice here you can use different materials uh, you can change the index by changing the composition as i was telling you before you can directly use it on the pdm as substrate and try to stretch it and without undergoing any lift up process or is it only for these simple structures not necessarily you can get from complex structures from discrete isolated islands like as you see here you can go down to make line like structures which can be used in photonic circuits for example as interconnects and also you see similar kinds of uh, structures as a large area meta surfaces also can be fabricated by this technique it's just a simple molding process
So is it only this kind of 2D structures? Can we think of making quasi 3D? Yes, we can. How? Now think about, as I was telling here, you increase the distance between the two pyramids. You control the thickness and then your film will break into two parts here. So one part will go up and the other part will fall down. And you have a two layer structures or quasi 3D structures. This is also feasible by this method. You can make continuous line like structures by taking the ratio of the controlling the ratio of the reflow time. And the other one is Raleigh plateau instability which you should control to, you should uh, stop the Raleigh plateau instability to have a continuous line like structure if you want to use it in waveguide applications. Chalcogenides are very good nonlinear materials, very good material for optical fibers. So there is a possible application using in photonic circuits also. Second, that another challenge with lithographic processes is that how do I go down to sub 10 nanometer uh, resolution or sub 10 nanometer gap? So by this process, what we call successive duetting, that means you deposit, you duet, you redeposit very, very thin film. <coughs> by this, you increase the particle size and hence you can decrease the gap between the particles down to 10 nanometer. You can go down to two, three nanometers, but uh, for statistical reason, let's keep it down to approximately around 10 nanometer. So this, uh, I'll show you later, gives rise to a strong field enhancement also. So with this, I'll come to quickly. So the time coming to run off now is already 11.50. So I'll show two applications. One is using this, you can get strong uh, absorbance, like around 80%. You can tune to get 100% also. 100% reflection for displays, right? So you can find application in display, reflecting displays. Absorption can be used just by having the resonance me scattering and it can be used in photo detectors, for example, right? You need highly absorbing materials. This application could be in reflective displays, as I was saying, or using your mechanochromic sensors where you tune the transmission here, as you see, that when you don't apply any strain, there is only one peak. You can see here, there is only one peak. And now as you start to stretch your sample, like this, one peak starts to move towards the red, towards the, this side, towards the IR side, and another kink appears, which moves towards the visible side, right? And what is the cause of this? This is nothing but the interparticle gap or what is called due to the periodicity. Your, let's say if you stretch along this direction, so this gap will increase, leading to the movement of this. And similarly, if you keep volume constant, you will apply uniaxial stress. So this part, it will decrease, right? Because your volume remains need to be same. And the gap between these two particles will decrease. And hence, this will move towards the blue region. So this can be used as a simple mechanochromic sensor application. The second thing is that, can I control the optical properties? And can I control the mode coupling using the same nanostructures? One way to control the it is by controlling the periodicity and the particle size. Okay, so you know that part periodicity gives your diffractive uh, mode, which is kind of a dark mode that they talk about. And then you have your particle size, which is a resonating mode or radiative mode, the di typical dipole modes, right? And if I combine them, I'll show you how if I combine these two processes, how do I achieve very sharp phanotype resonances in our structures, which will be later used for second harmonic generation and for biosensing. So how do you control periodicity? You take your same 350 nanometer, which I discussed before, okay? Periodic structures. And now during the nano imprinting process, you increase the force, okay? You increase the pressure. And as you increase the peer pressure, of course, you understand this PDMS starts to stretch and then you can all control using the same old structure, you can get varieties of periodicities from 350 nanometer to around 480 nanometer increase. You can go further, but yeah, there will be a saturation. And now use your successive duating technique. So you couple this nano imprinting pressure plus successive duating technique. By not changing the pressure, you change the periodicity. By changing the duating technique, successive duating processes, you change the particle sizes, right? So as you now 
so change the particle size what will happen you you start to see that as you in, that means how you change the particle size by increasing the thickness you start to see different modes under the same periodicity appearing of uh, the kind of this broad mode starts to split in the red because kind of asymmetric in nature so this is what is called more this is called critical coupling because of the coupling between the refractive mode and that of the lattice mode similarly now if you keep the same thickness let's say we take the 60 nanometer and slowly change the periodicity by changing the nano imprinting pressure you see from this symmetric structure you get a sh much sharper resonance when you are 0.15 megapascal which becomes very symmetric again as you increase the periodicity keeping the same thickness that means your lattice is really playing a role to tune your mode structure modal structures and by this process you get down to a sharp asymmetric resonance of full width half maximum around 4 4 nanometer which is typically possible because first of all by the process technique second i would say also because of the material because your material is lossless in this range of interest around near visible range in 700 nanometer now having this 4 nanometer and a strong field enhancement of around 100 times you could easily use it for second harmonic generation okay as you see here the blue dots so this is your strong field enhancement this is a field 100 nanometer 100 times field is enhanced you can use this is for a second harmonic generation like this you see resonant what is called as resonantly enhanced second harmonic generation and shg conversion uh, is around 10 to the power of minus 8 around 800 nanometer so it's here it increases to around 100 times you see it's 97 right that means you can get a conversion efficiency of 10 to the power of minus 6 using your amorphous material remember amorphous materials are not a good material for shg but so if you can think if you can use uh, this technique or process to uh, non centrosymmetric crystals you can further increase the second harmonic generation and then there is a lot of quest for search for finding materials and process techniques or geometries we don't do any complex geometries a simple square lattice <coughs> just by tuning the two modes the two uh, resonating modes we can actually get something 10 to the power of minus 6 conversion efficiency of shg so that means it's also five times five orders of magnitude higher than that of the thin film of selenium way higher than uh, so it's comparable with that of those three five compounds and which is of the, of course of the order of 10 to the power 6 10 to the minus 6 10 to the minus 5 but again remember those are material good material for uh, second harmonic generation and these are amorphous materials so we can think of about making something which is flexible photonics using shg by this method the other one which will be typically used is for biosensing application so first thing that you see that you put how do you do that you measure the transmission in bare in air let's say and then you put a on on your stop of substrate you put a liquid let's say a water here of refractive index 1.33 and you tune the refractive index and you see how the resonance shift so delta lambda so the resonance shift here is bulk index sensing value is 150 nanometer at a, at a par refractive index unit which is nothing great okay so this is nothing at all great people has made 300 and we ourselves have made so which is in the process something around 370 to 400 okay so this is nothing great but what is why it is not great because if you look into back to the field distribution so i should have zoomed in more you look the field is located on the surface so if if you have a drop of water here which is like a bulk this will own be filling so much your field and that means anything that means um, your uh, analyte should be located just on the surface to see the fill and this is important for monolayer sensing like for example protein monolayer sensing where even in a monolayer we kind of see a 10 nanometer shift as you see here experimentally and by simulation okay with a limit of detection of around we could detect go down to 0.5 parts per million which is kind of big uh, 
very, very minute quantity with a limit of detection, as you see here, of around 2.1 nanometers. So we take this dynamic range. And of course, above which, as you go increases, increase the concentration, as I was telling you in bulk, it will go, it's, it goes to saturating. Okay, so it's not a it's not a good bulk sensor, but it's more important for monolayer sensing. Okay, with this, I think we are kind of on time, and I'd like to thank you. Thanks for inviting me again. Uh, so my previous collaborators and uh, my new collaborators here in India also. And for more details, you can do. And my funding agencies who are funded who are funding me now. And uh, for more details on the meta surface, uh, particularly on the meta surface. You could go to the look into this paper and the news and views of uh, from the journal itself. Okay, thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Dasgupta. It's a wonderful presentation. So we have been uh, uh, we have we have received a few problems of or few questions from the attendees. So let, let me just call them one by one, sure, sure. so that they can ask you directly. So, sure. be, so whomsoever I am asking, so kindly unmute uh, uh, yourself and make your video on and ask the question uh, to Professor Das Gupta. So, Shombit, please go ahead. So thank you for this wonderful talk, sir. So I have one question. How this type of printing, nanometer scale printing are being realized? Means uh, people are using 3D printing technology or some printing technology or laser printing technology? Uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat again? Just I missed out something. The periodic nanometer scale printing meta surfaces. Uh, yeah. You, you are showing now. So mm -hmm. how they are being realized in practice? Means 3D printing or some other? Uh, uh, so uh, no, the periodic uh, meta surfaces that has been done uh, so far has been realized in practice by lithography. Okay. Okay. In this, nanometer scale, in this nanometer scale also yes so you can go for even lithography i think you can go if you have a good machinery you can go down to five or ten nanometers okay 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 so we'll... by typical e-beam lithography so of course photolithography won't work there yes. but uh, laser based methods but typically e-beam lithography okay so let me now ask uh, the next uh, question was from Rajarshi. Rajarshi, can you please unmute and make your video on? Go ahead. Uh, sir, I was uh, asking, uh, what should, uh, is there any uh, like uh, integral property of the fluid that is being used for the process? Like, should it be highly viscous? Uh, exactly. So, viscous? The thing. Right. exactly. So uh, it's, it should be highly viscous. Okay. So that means you are heating above the glass, just above the glass transition. For selenium is 40 degrees Celsius. But uh, so you go around 80 degrees Celsius. You should keep in mind that it should not be such that it should not be around its crystal crystallization temperature, right? Then it will crystallize. So it should be below. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. I also have gone another question from Seam MS. So can you please uh, just unmute and uh, make your video on? Okay, good morning, sir. Uh, what are the structural design strategies that we need to take into consideration when designing the unit cell of the meta surfaces? Like what is the periodicity and the, the shape and size and so on? Are there any design guidelines or initial calculation? So, yeah, so this depends on what application you want to do. For example, if you want to think about this meta lenses, right? So when you think about metal lenses, what you need to take into account is the there are two ways you can uh, that the phase the phase should be like you you can think about so if, when you think simply of your convex lens, right? Uh, so what happens is actually your phase changes from air to minus pi to plus pi, right? And then you have the zero here. So you need to take into account the phase change. The phase is one of the most important characteristics in photonics. Okay, so that's you need to this structure these things you need to take into account for the design if you think of metal lenses if you think about sensors of course you need to think about how to achieve uh, very sharp fluid half maximas because uh, that is what is important there where it can detect a minute uh, amount of analytes or not okay thank you sir thanks any other questions from anyone please kindly unmute yourself and please go ahead
Any other questions? Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes, sir, I have one question. Yeah. Please. Sir, how to uh, optimize our unit cells to have the resonance frequency to select the resonance frequency? How you will Sorry? select the frequency? Sorry. Uh, how will you decide that at which resonance frequency I want absorption? So how to decide that? Yeah. So uh, how to decide which resonance frequency you want to? Yeah. Suppose uh, we have applications. So for different application, I have to design. Different meta surface. So, how to design that meta surface? Okay. So, uh, yeah. So that's the thing. So, for example, if you think about, so uh, let's say you, I want to do something invisible, right? Right. Uh, let's say 600 nanometer. First thing you need to choose what kind of materials, right? Right. You need to use. You cannot just use silicon or something. That's what I was telling you. And then uh, you need to. So, if you want to think about something in the visible, that means your size scales down, right? Right. To something in the visible. So these are the two things that you need to take into account, I would say. So still there are many things like depend thickness of the substrate and the that is a one we can choose that it should be lambda by less than lambda by four. But then also if there, there can be any design rules so that at the exact frequency which you want to design, we can get because that is lacking in meta surface right now. Right. Can... So, uh, so uh, yeah. So in meta surfaces, what is that's a good question actually. What is lagging more is uh, to have such design, so you, there are many designs actually by which you can achieve this plus pi to minus pi or zero to two pi phase configuration, right? So one thing that is important here is that uh, when you think about your design, you cannot just make a big large pillar, okay, with a, a very with a very high aspect ratio because your pillars will fall down. Right, right, right. Right. So that means there you need to do a compromise, and there how it so that means. That means you cannot go down to lower index. Okay, if you now think about in using index materials as 1.5, then you have to make a large uh, aspect ratio structures to compensate for the index. Uh, to compensate for the index, right? So right. this is also not good. So that there comes. Uh, that's the thing, right? So you need to think about uh, like for if you want to use for like this lower index, it's better to go down, go up to in the NIR or in the mid IR to keep. In mind of the so-called fabrication technique, because it's sometimes impossible to fabricate. I mean, just fabricating some complex geometry does no, will not help. Right. Suppose you fabricate a double layer meta surface, and then I think that stretching that meta surface will not show the same property with the single. Exactly. Layer. Exactly. So thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, maybe from another one or two quick questions, please go ahead. Any other question? Kindly please unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay, uh, Dr. Dasgupta, I have a question. So, can mm -hmm. you please go to your slide number 14 that where you were talking mm -hmm. up about your the sinusoidal kind of structure where the fluids are in fact they are falling down? So, mm, just one second. Let me yeah. just share you share the slide again. Yeah. Slide number 14, right? Yeah, one four, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what I was just thinking of that, how to realize this exact sinusoidal pattern in practice means whenever, means I'm just thinking from that aspect, means how you can. So, yeah, so that's that's a good point that you cannot, for example, these templates are not exact sinusoidal, right? Mm -hmm. So in principle, yes, but one process can be, uh, so you, it's not necessary that you uh, make exact sinusoid, okay? What in principle we have done here, right? Here to get a near perfect array is we have increased, sorry, this is not a, we have actually etched it so high. You see? Mm -hmm. And then no defect on top because your fluid will because of this it's not gravity or something but the fluid will very easily break pinch off here mm -hmm. okay? this is the only way you can get a very good array if i understand correctly you cannot of yeah. course in reality you cannot fabricate a perfect sinusoid okay, okay. But to get a near perfect array what you can increase is you tune the curvature get it higher in curvature okay okay 
I'm getting your point here. Okay. Any yeah. other questions from anyone else? Any other questions? Okay. So, okay. I believe so. There is no more questions. So, let us thank uh, thank, Dr. Thank, thank, thank Dr. Again Dr. for Dr. this wonderful presentation. May I just uh, request all the volunteer, all these uh, attendees, to kindly turn on their video only, so that we can have a screenshot or for the for as, as a memory for uh, this particular wonderful talk with uh, Dr. Das Gupta. So yeah. Shombit, are you taking? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, you are taking. Right. Are you taking the screenshot? So just give me one minute. So my video yeah. is not turning on. Okay. 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 So now I can get. Yeah. So I'm, I'm taking the video, uh, screenshot, sir. Yeah, yeah. Please take okay. the screenshot. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you to thanks thank to all you. of you thanks, and a special special thanks to professor dasgupta to deliver this talk amidst his yeah. extremely busy schedule and uh, yeah so, thanks a lot for inviting yeah thank you sir thank you yeah and uh, let me tell to all the participants that yes this uh, video has been recorded and we will share it in our uh, in, in the youtube uh, youtube page of our uh, or youtube channel of the society okay very soon and thank you very much and stay tuned for uh, our next program thank you sir. thank you bye thank you thank you sir